Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Welcome to Spring Quarter Art Lecture Series. Um, I just want to begin by thanking everyone um, that helps that help make this possible, and we do this sort of at the beginning and the end of each quarter. Um, so we have people that help us with the space um, and finding the space large enough, sometimes having overflow. Um, and I want to thank the people in um, electronic media who record, make beautiful recordings that you can find on YouTube um, of most of the lectures. And that includes some of the media interns um, and some administrative help. We have help from the uh, college itself. And then Julie Ron um, volunteers to coordinate with the artists that we bring to campus. I'm going to go quickly through the lineup that we have this quarter. Um, today we have um, Eirik Steinhoff. And this is an, uh, it's really lovely to have someone from our campus. It's, very, it's an intimate uh, moment for us. A lot of you have studied with Eirik. Some of us have, he, have him as a colleague. Um, and then week four we have Rob Ree, who is a rubbernecker, a collector of accidents, a writer, a visual artist, and a teacher who teaches at Cornish, um, who will be coming down. And then week six is Fionn Mead. Uh, Fionn is an alum of Evergreen, and Fionn has been a curator at the Walker um, the Sculpture Center in New York uh, and is currently organizing something for this summer coordinating with making possibly a kind of biennial in Seattle and, a, and, and coordinating with the art fair. So um, doing a lot of exciting things in the art world. Week, we have a week seven, so usually we're on even weeks. This quarter we have a week seven um, guest, Michael Mejia, who's a writer. Um, and his touring for, uh, I think, his new novel, Tokyo. So he's coming to talk to us about his work. Um, week eight is Molly Zuckerman Hartung, uh, also an alum. Um, and Molly is a painter and a writer um, and is, was in the Whitney Biennial um, and is a visiting lecturer at Yale. So these are, so we have three people uh, connected to the college this quarter. That's really sort of exciting for us to realize um, what we offer and what we produce. And then we have some great uh, people across disciplines coming to visit us from different parts of the country. I'm going to introduce Lucian, um, who is this current student of the Literary Arts Capstone SOS with Miranda and Stephen, who's going to now introduce Irik. Thanks, Shah. Um, so I'm Lucian, um, and I'm honored uh, to be speaking here about Eirik, who's an especially amazing teacher, writer, and thinker, um, and has been faculty here at Evergreen for, I believe, five years. The first time I heard Eirik's name was at Bard College, Eric was teaching one section of the language and thinking program, which all freshmen took as their orientation to the college, in which we read Charles Darwin, Franz Kafka, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Hannah Arendt, and Gertrude Stein, among many others. I was taking the course with a different professor, but my friend Claire was in Eric's class, which on that particular day was to be held in a field where they would fly kites they had made out of plastic bags and straws. I'm not sure what they were doing, but it sounded fun. So I asked some of Eirik's old students and friends yesterday about how they would characterize his writing, teaching, and thinking styles, and here are some notes on what I got. Eirik has a special ability to constellate seemingly dis disparate disciplines, theories, histories, and agendas mapping a particular and unique canon into a multi-dimensional story that is constantly reshaping itself, and all this while simultaneously paying an enormous amount of attention to detail and context. 
He demonstrates the project of writing as thinking in class by using the tool of in-class free writing. He vulnerably demonstrates curiosity and progress. He follows long-term ongoing inquiries, chewing on and reworking familiar texts and problems when, the, when they continue to be fruitful. And he engages in genuine and generous collaboration, which means trusting his co-conspirators, as he calls us in the broadest sense, to continue the conversation beyond his presence and imagination. Eirik actively pursues pedagogy and poetics beyond the college campus, such as in the Washington Correction Center, where he has taught critical and creative reading and writing, and in the Men's Maximum Security Prison in Greenhaven, New York, where he taught a workshop on language and thinking. I had the pleasure of attending a youth summit along with Eirik and a handful of other students put together by the Black Prisoners Caucus at the Washington Correction Center in Shelton in Winter Quarter, where the students call him Professor Eirik, a name that they collaboratively agreed upon. He is teaching Gateways for Incarcerated Youth next year with three guiding questions. One, how do we responsibly represent what we have experienced? Two, what is the role of the person with knowledge? And three, what needs to be the case for things to be otherwise? Eric got a BA from Bard College and a PhD in English from the U University of Chicago, and he has taught in numerous schools around the country. A Fiery Flying Rule is the name of the pamphlet he curated and circulated in Oakland in 2011 and 2012, which will be published as a collection in book form later this year from Station Hill Press, and which I believe he will be talking about today. You may have noticed he's also prone to handing out similar information and writing on campus. Eric's blog, which is also under the title A Fiery Flying Rule, is like the pamphlet, a collage, and references physicality and polyvocality simply by assuming this collage aesthetic, letting texts be seen in the fonts that have been chosen for them elsewhere. Eric's writing includes propaganda in a most delicate and open form, which can only be understood in the period in which it was written and will continue to be useful for an unforeseeable time. It is also exemplary of the scope towards which his language net is cast, a scope that includes familiars and contemporaries, regular old sayings, formal theory, and diverse humor. I will read his latest blog post, which gives a more vivid account of these qualities. My partner's father called a fiery flying rule my little newspaper. I like that, but I need to point out that in addition to reporting the news, which in fact they sometimes did, the rules also supplied readers with what I called the old news, a new form then, the old's paper. We suffer the news in the moniform of a relentlessly double-fisted pummeling we receive through our screens, one fist delivering spectacle, the other doling amnesia, the combo producing a kind of anesthetization, clogging our capacity to feel or think, let alone understand or make sense of what's going on before our very eyes. If you see something, say something. Yeah, right. I see a racist, sexist, settler colonialism that knows no tomorrow. I'm sure I don't know what the antidote is, but I find the antonym suggestive. Let's pit the odds against the news. Rather than breath breathlessly asking what's happening or what's going on or what's new, more often than not by hitting the refresh button, the olds invite us to slow down and ask, when did this start going on and why is this still happening and how did they do this before? Rather than apprehension, the objective is comprehension and the sense of getting and holding it together rather than getting got, being had by distraction, seized by fear, or arrested by the cops. Over and against the closed fists of spectacle and amnesia, the open hands of the olds might be archeology span and genealogy, with the proviso that the concern is not so much with the origins per se, and more so with usage and application. The olds are a form of study contra stupefaction, an instrument in service of a discipline that we might call anarchaeology, an antithetical investigation of rules, archi, both in terms of and against the grain of their beginnings, ar archi. 
an inquiry into conditions of possibility. It's a special treat to have Eirik here today to talk about his own work as a person and a writer, a thinker and an active citizen. For as most of us who've been Eirik's students know, it happens only very tastefully. Thanks, Eirik. Please welcome Eirik. Thanks so much, Lucian. Um, I'm incredibly moved and thought that I could just sit there and um, not have to come up and do anything. That would have been nice. Um, so I'm really, really excited to be able to talk about um, some of the work that I've been um, doing over the years. And um, although we just heard um, some things I said against screens, I'm actually making heavy use of the screen for this presentation. Um, and what I had in mind was that I would um, read some poems, um, show you some pamphlets, read some prose that's related to those pamphlets, and then if I've got my timing right, um, I should be able to end with a poem as well. Um, and at first, it will seem like these are different projects, that the, the poems I read and the pamphlets are um, not of a piece, but um, I think by the end, we'll see where the intersection might lie. Um, and so I'm just going to begin with a poem. I'm going to have to turn my head like this to actually read it. Love has set me up like a bullseye for arrows, like sunned snow, like wax in a furnace, like clouds in the wind. I've gone hoarse, mama, clamoring for mercy, and you don't give a damn. Your eyes emit a mortal coup, which space and time can't save me from. Straight from you, this makes you laugh came this sun, that furnace, and these winds. Thoughts of you are arrows. Your face is solar. Desire is a furnace. With these munitions, love punctures, dazzles, and destroys me. Your sweet, angelic, sing-song speeches and that minty breath I can't escape are the breeze my life is a fugitive in front of. So this is a sonnet by Francis Petrarch. It was written uh, probably in the 1340s, 1350s. So it's between six and 700 years old. Um, this is a broadside that was published in 2009 as part of a um, publication project that Brian Teer, a wonderful poet, and essayist and uh, bookmaker um, and I collaborated on. Um, and um, I translated a handful of Petrarch's sonnets and they were published in a chapbook that Brian made and then together he and I made that, um, or rather this broadside to accompany, um, to accompany that publication. And why did I start translating Petrarch? Um, I was writing a dissertation on uh, the idea of contingency or chance in the English Renaissance, so Shakespeare and his contemporaries. And one of the poets that I was writing about, Sir Thomas Wyatt, is one of the first people to have translated Petrarch into English um, in the early 16th century. So I figured I should translate some of his poems myself as a kind of fieldwork um, to see what um, this, this poet I was working on was up to. Um, it was also the case that the department I was in required a language exam. And um, I didn't really have um, very good mastery of any language other than English. Maybe that was why I was an English major. And um, I worked out a deal where I could translate some of Petrarch's sonnets as my language exam. 
And so that's what turned into this project. Um, it was a kind of lucky intersection of some of my own research and scholarship on the one hand, and um, what felt at the time like obnoxious uh, requirements by my PhD program. So in fact, I feel quite fortunate to have had the chance to do that. Um, in, in, um, this was 2008, 2009. Um, I've continued to work on sonnets. Um, and I'll have a little bit more to say about the sonnet as a form, but I wanted to read four more poems, um, this time by a, um, a poet who is writing in Mexico, in the, or what we now call Mexico, in the late um, 17th century. She was born 1651, died 1695. She's known as Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. Um, and she was a renegade nun who took it upon herself to write poetry, even though that was not um, uh, appropriate behavior um, according to the norms and standards of the time in which she lived. And so she's using the same form as Petrarch, the sonnet form, but she's doing her own thing with it. For one thing, we can just bear in mind that the sonnet as a form, as it was developed by um, Petrarch, and as many of you probably know, it became hugely influential as a form. Shakespeare wrote many sonnets. Many others have written sonnets as well. One of the things that's distinctive about the sonnet as a form is that it tends to do with love, and it tends to involve representation of the beloved. Since most sonnets are written by men, that means that sort of baked into the form are representations of women. And so for Sor Juana to be writing sonnets this early within the tradition um, is actually quite um, provocative. And um, her poems resonate with a kind of resistant energy that I find um, especially, especially captivating. Um, and so since I showed you the beautiful broadside that, that Brian made for the Petrarch poem, I thought for the Sor Juana poems, I would just have a screenshot of a Google Doc, um, including the squiggly line underneath the words that don't really make sense, um, so that you can see something like work in progress. And there's four of these. I'm going to read through them with relative speed. Um, most people know that sonnets are 14 lines long. That's important information. Whenever you see something that's 14 lines long, I guarantee you it's a sonnet. Even if it doesn't say it is one, you can just say, oh, that's a sonnet. Um, the same way you can say if something has four legs, it's a quadruped. Um, but some other information about sonnets that most people don't know. First of all, it takes about a minute to read one. So a sonnet is about a minute of language. Curiously, they tend to weigh in at about 100 words, give or take. Just a strange phenomena that, um, by counting, I, um, I discovered. So I'm going to read four of these. Um, and you can read along. This, the screen is probably too small. Um, the first one is number 148. Celia saw a rose in the park. Happily ostentating vain pomp, shining with crimson and scarlet, its delicate face cheerfully basking. And it said, enjoy without fear of fate the brief course of your fresh life. For the death that comes tomorrow just can't take what you are enjoying this instant. And though death presses in incessantly and your fragrant life begins to fade, feel not the death of your beauty and moxie. Look now to what experience counsels. What a fortune to die as a beauty, to not see the outrages of aging. The next one is 164. This evening, my darling, when we spoke, in your face and movements I could tell that with words you were unpersuadable, and yet I wanted to show you my heart Love understood me and helped me out, achieving the impossible. Through these tears, grief spilled, my heart unmade and distilled. Enough of these rigors, darling. Enough. No to the rigors, sorry, enough of these rigors, darling. Enough. No to the torment of jealousy's tyranny. No to vile doubts that offset your tranquility with bad dullness and fraudulent 
inferences. Since in these tears you have seen and touched my heart, unmade entirely in your hands. Two more of these. 165. And I might just mention most of these I translated um, between the beginning of 2017 and last summer. Um, so they're, they're slightly um, dated, but there's also um, a few um, contemporary references that have been smuggled in. Um, that's, that's the extent of the spoiler alert on this one. Wait up, my most untamable shadow. Spell image and spectacle I most desire. Lovely illusion I'd gladly die for. Sweetest fiction I'd painfully live for. Tractored toward your charm magnet, my obedient heart is at your service. So why this enamorating flattery, only to mock me with furtive gestures? You can't blaze on, satisfied, tweeting that your tyranny trumps me. <laughs> yes, you've circumvented the skinny ribbons I've tried to cinch your fantastic form in, but it's no big deal that you outfox my bear hug. In my fantasy, you remain captive. And then the last one, 166. That I'm not being chased by Fabio, who I love, is a grief unequaled in my experience. What's more, I'm being chased by Silvio, who I abhor. A more minor malady, though no less afflicting. Whose suffering wouldn't be exhausted by these things always resonating within earshot? Both the vain arrogance of the one you love and the exhausting moaning of the one you disdain. If Silvio's surrender tires me to no end, Fabio is no less exhausted by my waving white flag. And if I seek to be the source of his pleasure, the other one seeks to supply what pleases me. If to be active and passive thus, subject and object at once, is to be my torment, I say, fuck this. I am done with chasing and being chased. All right. So those were some sonnets to begin. And as I said, I hope to be able to end with a sonnet as well. Um, but before I move much further, um, I thought I would put a, a big six letter word on the screen, whence, which stands for where am I coming from? What am I doing? What's my um, vector? Where are my, um, um, what's, what's my agenda? And as some of you know, I um, teach at Evergreen, which means I'm not housed in a department, which means I get to say, what do I teach? I teach how to do things with words. Right now I'm teaching a program with that title, and the subtitle is Poesis and Praxis. Um, I'm gonna zero in on poesis for a moment, and we can just say that um, poetics, um, as a, in a rough and ready definition, we can say that poetics is the study of making in language. That's my placeholder definition for poetics that I think is um, uncontroversial and um, something that we can, uh, we can work with and talk with. I also like to go a little bit deeper in the roots of the word and um, to shift from poetique, um, which is um, the Greek noun, to poeian, which is the Greek verb that's at the root of this word, um, poetic or poem for that matter. And I do that inspired in part by uh, a critic and scholar named Stathis Gurguris, who um, says the following. I prefer to counteract the substantive name of a skill, poetique, with the infinitive verb of a practice, poean whose precise skills are voluminous and indefinite, never exhausted by the skill of crafting verses, and indeed, never immune to the transformational process of the practice. By the gesture of poean, I mean not merely the art of making, but the art of forming, and thereby, within the domain of history, transforming. Shaping is always altering, and thus to form is always to transform, which I conceive in a materialist way 
as the process of bringing otherness to bear upon the world, as opposed to receiving otherness as external authority. The energy of poeian is dramatic. Literally, to form is to make form happen, to change form, including one's own. So I find that quite animating and mobilizing, to think about the relationship between forming and transforming. And so when we think of something like the sonnet as a form, and especially when we see it in the hands of somebody like Sor Juana, we can see something of that transformative potential at work. The other thing that um, inspires me in this way of defining poetics that Gorgoras offers is that um, it allows us to think about otherness and the otherwise. So we've already heard this question thanks to Lucian's introduction, but um, an overarching question for me is what needs to be the case for things to be otherwise? And we can oscillate and jostle with this question in multiple ways. Um, at one point, not long ago, I thought it was exactly the wrong question. That the correct question to ask was, what needs to be the case for things to stay the same? I don't want things to change anymore. I'm done with change. I'm done with change. But this question keeps, um, keeps me in motion, even though I maybe resist its um, overtures um, along the way. So, to the pamphlets, and Lucian mentioned these have been collected um, and are coming out shortly as a book. I've got um, one sample here. It's got post-it notes in it because um, it has a couple of things that I um, hope could be otherwise. Um, I can maybe confess, since this is an art lecture and maybe I'm allowed to be slightly confessional, um, I am a perfectionist. Another way of saying it is, I am a notorious procrastinator. I don't get anything done until the deadline, and even then, maybe not. But there is a correlation, I think, between perfectionism and procrastination, and if there are some of you in the room who um, have some of those tendencies, I say, right on. <laughs> Take your time. I once got a fortune cookie that said, very accurately, you are a perfectionist. I was like, how did you know? But then it had more. It said, you are a perfectionist. Don't spoil it. So if there's one thing I want to relate to you today, it's that. If you're a perfectionist, don't spoil it. Make it work for you. Um, so, yep, the pamphlets are, they were called A Fiery Flying Rule. I'm going to say a little bit about the project, um, but since I um, have a book that's coming out, I thought I would do a kind of um, story time with it. And this is the cover, and I've got a preface which puts the thing in context, and rather than um, improvising, I thought I would just read. So this is from the preface of A Fiery Flying Rule. This volume collects a sequence of pamphlets that circulated in the vicinity of the Oakland Commune, AKA Occupy Oakland, beginning on the 2nd of November 2011 with the general strike that shut down the Port of Oakland and ending six months later on May Day 2012. Under a title that is recycled from a pair of pamphlets rife with prophetic do-it-yourself political theory, which were first released in London in 1649 by the ranter Abiezer Cope, shortly after the decapitation of Charles I. These 21st century rules were an attempt to splice the antinomian enthusiasm of the mid-17th century with the manic connect-the-dot logic of Dr. Bronner's soap bottle labels as a means of metabolizing and inflecting the convulsion. So that's the first paragraph, which I regret to notice is one sentence. Um, <laughs> next paragraph. What is the rule of crisis? What role might we play in the metamorphosis? What might we contribute to a movement's momentum? to keeping it on a roll. A rule, R-O-U-L-E, is an experimental response 
to these questions. A shape in which to catch and release the signal cascade triggered by the Occupy episode. Using the permissions of the commonplace book, on the one hand, to yoke heterogeneous materials together, and the potential of poetry, on the other, as a uniquely responsible medium in which one might, as Robert Duncan once suggested, keep the ability to respond, these rules are both a call and a response to a collective attempt to figure out new forms of belonging together, as well as forms fit for communicating these new forms, for making our knowledge common. So there's the first of the rules, or the first page, rather, of the rules. And I should mention, um, I handed out uh, a bunch right before the lecture started. I don't think all of you got one, but if you would like one, let me know, and I'll make sure that you get one of these rules. Um, oh, and now I have a pause where I just play a couple slides while I take a drink of water. And I should also say that I've um, got things more or less structured here, but if there are questions along the way, I'd be more than happy to um, entertain them in the mix. I mean, we can have Q&A time at the end, but if things are bubbling up to the surface, just let me know and we can pause and um, address what's on your mind. So these were some photographs from downtown Oakland um, in um, what was being called at the time Oscar Grant Plaza, which is right in front of City Hall. And this is a photograph of an Evergreen alum, um, James, who's my, how do we say this, my, my nephew-in-law or my nephew-outlaw since I'm not married, um, but he's the nephew of my partner. And he and I were at one of these general assemblies in Oakland. And um, I might also mention that the first time I came to Evergreen was in the spring of 2012. And um, I didn't work here yet. I didn't really know anybody here. And there was a symposium on Occupy-related things. And so, in fact, some of what I'm talking about right now um, overlaps with um, that first um, talk, that first lecture that I gave at Evergreen. Uh, but so here's a, a, a greener, one of us um, sitting and participating in one of these meetings in, in Oakland. This, I think, would have been probably October or November of 2011. So this is the first rule. You can see the date that's on there, 11 to 11. That's the day on which um, it first was published and circulated. Um, it was also the day of the so-called general strike um, that indeed shut down the Port of Oakland for um, some 12 or 24 hours. Um, so not exactly a strike, maybe more of a blockade, but still the, the language of, of the strike was in the air. Um, and so um, Lucian already introduced this idea of the news 
as something that we actually suffer from in um, even more miserable ways than we knew were possible. Um, so the news really does us in, and I really don't know what the solution is, but I think um, the antonym is suggestive, the olds. And so um, with that in mind, I wanted to offer some context. Why is this thing called a fiery flying rule? Who was this Abbeyser Cope? character that I mentioned in the preface, what was going on in the 1640s and 1650s. Um, I wanted to just do a historical sidebar here to offer some context and to give you a sense of the um, larger archive of texts that I was in conversation with. So here's the first original fiery flying rule. Notice the spelling, R-O-L-L. -L. Um, and you might be able to see at the bottom, 1649 is when it was published. Um, so this is the first of the fiery rules, and here's a second fiery rule. And to my knowledge, Abbey's or Cope only made two of these rules, but it seemed like too good of an opportunity to pass up the possibility of continuing the serial. Um, and so I ended up um, picking up the mantle um, several hundred years later um, in the context of Occupy Oakland. Um, but so Abbey Ezer Cope was a, how can we say this, um, uh, a very enthusiastic person who um, in contemporary accounts was known for um, indulging in tobacco and drink and um, had the, um, the, the idea that he was a prophet, that he was in conversation with um, the Lord and had access to um, divine insight and took it upon himself to project into the political circumstances of his time the insights that he was finding through these means, prophecy, drink, tobacco. He was known as a ranter. That was the term by which um, these kinds of people um, were known. This was also the age of the Quakers. The Quakers emerged in this context, and they were called Quakers for a reason. They weren't calm people. They were agile, active, and actually quite um, dynamic and engaging and um, um, problematic for the powers that be. No, you can't let women preach. That's totally unacceptable. The Quakers would do that. Um, I forget the name of the gentleman who rode into um, Bristol, the town of Bristol, um, on a donkey on, um, on the Sunday before um, Easter, as if he were the second coming. Um, so there were lots of enthusiastic performances of these sort, um, of this sort. Um, Abbey Yeezer Cope was very much in this kind of um, political conversation, and what they were looking for was a distribution of power or a redistribution of power. Um, this was in the, um, in the middle of the English Civil War, in the middle of the 17th century, and it just so happens that this is also when Sor Juana was writing. I didn't figure that out until last night when I started adding some dates to these names. Of course, Sor Juana was writing in what's now called Mexico and engaging in a different kind of um, engagement with um, tradition, um, renovating the possibilities of the forms that she found herself in. Um, but so that pleased me that there was a kind of um, historical overlap between these two figures I've been, I've been thinking with um, for a little while. Um, another contemporary of Abbey Ezer Cope, this takes us back to England, was named Gerard Winstanley. He was rather more practical and maybe less drunk, um, maybe less prophetic, um, but also um, a very prolific publisher. And um, just to give you a taste of the kinds of language that were being used in this period, in the 16, six, late 1640s, early 1650s, here is one of the texts that Winstanley wrote. An appeal to the House of Commons, which would be the lower house of the, the British Parliament. An appeal to the House of Commons desiring their answer, whether the common people shall have the quiet enjoyment of the commons and wastelands, or whether they shall be under the will of lords of manners still, i.e., can the people have access to 
the common land and can they do their thing there? Um, this was a big question at the time in terms of distribution of property, in terms of distribution of political responsibility. Um, here's some language from one of Cope's rules. The true communion amongst men is to have all things common and to call nothing one half one's own. And the true external breaking of bread is to eat bread together in the singleness of heart and to break thy bread to the hungry and tell them it's their own bread and else and etc else your religion is in vain. So here would be an instance of Cope invoking biblical precedent of here's how communion should really work, where you give food to the needy. And if you're not doing that, your religion is in vain. You're a hypocrite. Um, so a few words about the role of the prophet. Here's some language from Pierre Bourdieu, who's a sociologist writing um, in France in the late 20th century. So long as the crisis has not found its prophet, the schemes with which one thinks the world overturned are still the product of the world to be overturned. The prophet is the one who can contribute to realizing the coincidence of the revolution with itself by operating the symbolic revolution that is called political re revolution. Political revolution finds its fulfillment only in the symbolic revolution that makes it exist fully, in giving it the means to think itself in its truth, that is, as unprecedented, unthinkable, and unnameable, according to all the previous grids of classification or interpretation. That felt suggestive to me at the time in 2011, 2012, in terms of finding new forms through which to articulate um, the shape of the times we found ourselves in. And I'm not claiming um, the mantle or the, um, the position of the prophet by any means, but I do find Bourdieu's articulation of the role um, quite suggestive. And um, it, it's something that, that stays with me. Here's some language from Abiezer Cope that gives us another taste of this kind of prophetic discourse. For I am risen, for I am risen, for I am risen to shake terribly the earth, and not the earth only, but the heavens also, etc. But here I shall cease informing you. You may, for your further information, if you please, read my rule to all the rich inhabitants of the earth. Read it if you be wise. I shall now advise you. So he's like, yeah, go read my pamphlet. I wrote it all down. And then you go read his pamphlet, and he says things like this. My dear one, all or none, everyone under the sun, mine own, my most excellent majesty in me, hath strangely and variously transformed this form. And then that, I couldn't help but connect with some photographs from the streets of Oakland and some language that was being circulated um, by the Oakland Police Officers Association. And this was a way for me to um, collapse the two time zones in which I was, um, in which I'd found myself. So to take a step back, where did I first hear about Abby Yeezer Cope? In a classroom in a class called the Archaeology of Romanticism, or an Archaeology of Romanticism, um, taught by Sari Makdizi. Um, here's um, some, some bits from the syllabus for that class. This would have been in 1999 at the University of Chicago. It was the end of my first year in graduate school. And it was one of the best classes um, I'd, I'd taken. Um, we were really set loose on this archive of texts and told to find something that spoke to us, that resonated, that we thought was interesting, um, to do a deep dive um, into it, and then to come back to seminar with um, a report of what we'd found. The professor was working on a book um, that came out a few years later um, on William Blake, who's a romantic poet, um, but he was trying to situate Blake in relationship to the political um, um, agitations that had preceded him in England. Um, so here's a paragraph from um, my teacher's book that came out a few years later. And he's referring specifically to Abiezer Cope, the author of A Fiery Flying Rule. 
I mention Cope's project, however, not out of antiquarian theological curiosity, but because of the way in which it demonstrates how a certain theological or philosophical conception of being enables a certain understanding of form in both an aesthetic and political sense. For Cope, the liberation of the narrator or author from the confines of his own form allows him to speak in a variety of tongues, to abandon or escape his own narrow selfhood and assume the voice of the Lord precisely as a common power. I'm okay with all of that until the last clause about the Lord as a common power. That's absolutely the case for Cope. There's no question that he saw himself as a prophet um, in direct communication with um, um, the Lord, capital L. Um, I took Cope as a kind of model for this very thing, um, the, the, the permission to speak in a variety of forms, to speak in a variety of tongues, to take on Cope as a kind of editorial disguise or a kind of um, mask um, for my own um, practice in putting together these rules. So the book ends with the epistle to the reader and I thought I would read a few um, paragraphs from this as well, so you can have more of a sense of the context in which this work was being circulated. And I've got an epigraph as well from um, the great critic Kenneth Burke. Once one has pamphleteered, however, dare he not in revision try, even at the risk of canceling himself, to transform the contentious into the speculative. I think I've got some text here as well, yep. A fiery flying rule first ignited and took flight in early November 2011, when the writing of my dissertation was so rudely interrupted by rioting in the streets of downtown Oakland, the city in which I worked and where a number of my friends lived, some of whom had been arrested on the morning of October 25th, 2011, in the course of the police department's first eviction of the Oakland Commune, that encampment also known as Occupy Oakland, arrayed alongside a sprawling oak planted by Jack London's widow in the plaza in front of City Hall that had been renamed by the people camping there after Oscar Grant Jr., a young black man shot to death while under arrest in the Fruitvale BART station by a transit cop early New Year's Day, 2009. My writing, concerned the sense of chance in the English Renaissance and was long overdue, thanks in part to a distracting sequence of uprisings earlier that year, actions at a distance variously articulating a general antagonism in Egypt, in Wisconsin, in Athens, in London. When it kicked off across the bay from where I lived in San Francisco, it was, as Sir Philip Sidney puts it in another context, no hard matter to consider. I added the commune to my commute. The other day, a European writer I met told me that a Bay Area poet we know in common had said when they bumped into each other at Zuccotti Park in October 2011 that Occupy Oakland was basically run by poets. I said, I'm not sure whether run by is quite the way I'd put it. One learns to take care with the hierarchies embedded in the verbs one chooses when these actions are represented. But there can be no question that poets were dedicated participants in that impromptu and improbably long-lived experiment that transpired in the plaza and beyond from late 2011 into 2012. One handwritten sign I saw put it plainly, poetry is in the streets, poets too, working in the kitchen, working in the garden, working in the children's tent and the information tent, making speeches at general assemblies, debating the shape of things, proposing courses of action, handing out flyers, announcing, announcing them, taking photographs and making video recordings, reporting on the situation for the national and international press, and not least of all, collectively composing and circulating a newspaper called the Oscar Grant Plaza Gazette which printed lists of camp needs, told the news in the form of report backs from meetings and actions, announced workshops, 
and delivered passionate dispatches from the field, headlined from a comrade, intermittently peppering the proceedings with verse. As another sign I saw put it, and I read this as an ideogram, poetry, tenderness, rebellion. Some of you might recognize these lines from Walt Whitman. Here are some lines on a sign um, from Allen Ginsberg. If you came to Oscar Grant Plaza at midday on a Sunday in late 2011 and walked around the elaborate encampment, Chances are you would have encountered a motley crew arranged loosely on the staircase facing the entrance to the BART station at 14th and Broadway, across the street from the Rite Aid, an intersection that had been the scene of repeated confrontations with the police, most notably the fusillade of tear gas and flashbangs that dominated the evening of October 25th, following the first clearance of the plaza. On the Sundays I'm remembering, though, that area was where something called Poetry for the People transpired an improvised collective performance that took place each week of the occupation and continued to the end of the year following the second eviction in mid-November. So this is the second rule that I made. The invitation at Poetry for the People was general and the idea was simple, to read to one another from the radical tradition, however broadly or narrowly conceived, including your own poems or the poems of your friends, to read sometimes with the assistance of proper amplification, sometimes, if you so desired, through the people's mic, but usually with your own voice, unenhanced. Duncan, De Prima, Whitman, Blake, Waldman, Retallick, Neruda, Baraka, Shelley, Dickinson, Oppen, Howe. Such might be the ad hoc set list on any given Sunday. Poetry for the people, P for P for short, and named after the arts activism program founded by poet and Berkeley professor June Jordan, supplied an opportunity to congregate under the sign of poetry and populism conjoined in an effort to refashion both. We gathered and performed a supply of shapely words, planted seeds that took root and sprouted in unexpected forms, arguments, alliances, romances. It was a de facto affinity groups, laboratory, and seminar, a means of making itself, sorry, a means of making itself visible to itself by doing things to and with each other with words. A rhizomatic effervescence was in effect. The thing was open-ended, apt to the moment, and often contagious. Unsuspecting passers-by frequently tarried and often joined in. I rode my bike the first time I went from a sublet on the north side of Bernal Heights, a San Francisco neighborhood whose long-standing working-class character was being extirpated before our very eyes by a rampant real estate market accelerated by the employees of Google and Facebook who, we were told, appreciated easy access to the highway down to Silicon Valley. I remember reading with the human microphone, first forwards and then in reverse, some lines from Susan Howe's Souls of the Labity Tract that would later be printed on the first page of the third rule. Here we are, here we are. You can't hear us, you can't hear us, without having to be us, without having to be us. Knowing everything we know, knowing everything we know. You know you can't, you know you can't. So I made 25 in all. These are the first pages of the remaining ones that we haven't seen yet. I think the tear gas acupuncture treatment one was in fact the most popular.
A tenth got called a fiery flying spruel. I'm not sure you can see the SP that's been added there. Um, the, the equivalent of Red Square at um, University of California at Berkeley is called Spruel Plaza. So I needed to make an amendment for this one. And you may not be able to see at the bottom, but the photograph, there's a banner that says the regents are the 1%. The regents would be the, effectively the board of trustees for University of California. photograph on the bottom left, some of you may recognize it's um, somebody who'd been tear gassed in Seattle, in fact. So like I said, there's a couple of these that are circulating around. I didn't make copies of all of them. Um, if you want copies, let me know. I can give you a couple. Um, there's usually a few stashed somewhere in my office or in my backpack. Um, if there's one overarching thesis that I've drawn from this project, it would be this claim. Poetry makes nothing happen. And I thought I would conclude by working through um, what I mean exactly with that, with that claim. Um, so these are a couple of, I've got maybe one paragraph here. Yeah, two paragraphs. If you hold out a piece of paper to someone walking toward you, chances are they'll take it especially if you give off the suggestion that you are up for conversation, but also that the transaction might make it possible to not have one. Then again, there's that old Mitch Hedberg line that goes, whenever I walk, people try to hand me out flyers. And when someone tries to hand me out a flyer, it's kind of like they're saying, here, you throw this away. Charles Bernstein makes a clever point somewhere about the value of poetry. A blank piece of paper from the perspective of a copy shop is worth about 10 cents, while the same piece of paper with a poem copied out on it isn't worth a dime. I forget what his exact punchline is, but I do remember the beginning of his poem, The Clupsy Girl. Poetry is like a swoon with this difference. It brings you to your senses. The difference between sense and sense, S-E-N-S-E -S -E, and C-E-N-T-S, is what's at stake, really. The currency of the verse. The rules gave me a role to play, as well as a game to be in, whose rules were fantastically simple to follow. As a pamphleteer, your job is to give away as many pamphlets as you can to as many people as possible. Playing the game gave me something to do, I could show up with my backpack and my snacks and my water and my camera, and rather than having to pick a place to stand and fidget while waiting for things to get started, or worrying about where or who my friends were, I had put myself into a position that allowed me to effectively canvas the crowd in an attempt to spread the pigment the rules manifested, the frequency or tone or angle of inflection they presumed, an attempt to reflect the unprecedented. Oh, I already have that one, people would sometimes say. That seems unlikely, I'd reply, as this one's brand new this afternoon. 
or else I would dig down more deeply into my stack to see if there were ones that they didn't yet have that they might be interested in. Often enough for it to become a pattern of some sort, I was told by elderly women, of whom there were a surprisingly large number, especially in Berkeley, that while they themselves did not read poetry, their friends did. And could they take some extra copies to pass along? I remember that the one with the acupuncture treatment for tear gas went like hotcakes on Sproul Plaza, the evening of the beat-ups doled out by the sheriff's deputies. From a mid-November 2011 email to some friends in the Midwest, shortly after the clearance of the second plaza. When I hand these pamphlets out at these mass gatherings, and over a thousand copies are in circulation now, not counting the 500 dispatched in Milwaukee, that would have been by my friend Roberto, I say to people, here's some poetry, or here's a poem about a mosquito, or here's some literature. More often than not, people reach out for them without Having, without me having to thrust them into their hands. If someone is reluctant, which also happens, especially on Sproul Plaza at Berkeley where there's a lot of leafleting going on, my line is, just a little poetry, nothing to worry about. It makes nothing happen. But I mean that Auden line in a serious way. So that's a quote from a poem by W.H. Auden. Poetry makes nothing happen. It's from his elegy to W.B. Yeats. But I mean that Auden quote in a serious way. Poetry makes nothing happen, which is to say, it actually conjures the vacuums we're faced with, makes them visible in ways we otherwise might not see, and slash but also gives us permission to fill those vacuums too with rare new forms of language and thought, new grammars of belonging. So there's more here, but I think I should end. And I promised myself, and I think I told you that I was going to end with a poem. And this is another Sor Juana poem. And it's an instance of poetry making nothing happen. By which I mean, it ends with the word nada, which is the word nothing in Spanish. And you'll see as the poem proceeds that as it builds up to that word, it's an active instance of poetry engaging in a form of negation. And in this instance, we're shifting gears now from the pamphlets back to the sonnets. But in this instance, I would propose what Sor Juana is doing is interrupting a form of representation that in its received tradition is a form that exploits and dominates, and the form in her hands is turned into something else. This was um, published, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago in a Seattle architecture journal. For some reason, they were doing um, a special issue on the idea of efficiency, and so I wrote a short essay and contributed this poem and for some reason, they went for it, which was quite pleasing to me. I have extra copies of this as well, so if you didn't get a copy of the other um, material, um, I, I can certainly give you um, a handout with this. And in fact, it has to do with a portrait. The idea is that she's responding to a portrait that has been made of her, but that she finds to be an inaccurate representation. So she's disrupting the gift. And the, 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 idea, the idea of the poem is that she's refusing it in a kind of demonstrative way. She's pointing. And so I've had to insert a couple of, um, I don't know, dramatic um, stage directions um, to get the point across. And I'm going to have to turn my head. Actually, This, you see, pointing, chromographic counterfeit that ostentates art's privilege with fake syllogisms of color is calculated to mislead your senses. This, in which flattery has pretended, A, to excise perennial horror 
and B, by vanquishing early onset rigor mortis to triumph over aging and oblivion, is a vacant artifice of caution, is a flower blown delicate, is a bivouac flimsy against fate, is a foolish diligence done wrong, is a deciduous affair, and properly seen is a cadaver, is dust, is shadow, is nothing. Thanks. I ended with 25 minutes to spare, so we've got time for questions. I'd be really interested to hear questions, comments, observations. There's a microphone um, if you must, and if you must not, you can say your question and I will repeat it so that it gets captured um, by the recording. Can't be a perfectionist, can't be a procrastinator. There's a general strike going on. Yeah, so the question is about process um, in, in relationship to um, the Olds paper. And is there more? Yeah, now that's, that's a good question too. So the relationship between a fiery flying rule uh, on the one hand and this larger um, cultural um, manifestation um, known as Occupy Oakland. And is there a, a what's, what's the sort of representational relationship between the two? Yeah. Um, I don't claim to represent um, that historical moment. I'm responding to my own experience in it. It's a complicated historical moment that in some ways feels like it was 50 years ago. Um, and that sort of, it pains me to say it that way, but um, it feels like the, um, what, what I experienced and what I think many people experienced as a sense of political possibility and kind of political opening, um, political awakening, um, right now feels incredibly foreclosed and remote. Um, that said, as, of, as I was trying to share with some of these paragraphs, there were lots of people who were artists, who were writers, who were teachers, um, who were engaged in um, pretty unusual behavior for um, students, teachers, you know, camping. You're gonna go camping in the grass in front of City Hall, not just for a day, but for weeks. And you're going to contribute your um, resources, photocopy machines, or the ability to um, write a quick press release, or your ability to uh, facilitate a conversation um, to something that uh, you're, gonna you're gonna contribute these resources into contexts where um, you don't necessarily find yourself all that often as a poet, as a teacher, as a student. Um, so I think there was a lot of um, interesting cross-pollination and um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to suggest that um, people weren't already very involved as activists or, or political um, animals before Occupy kicked off, but I can, I can say the sensation was of a lot of people suddenly waking up and realizing, oh, there's a way to be engaged and we don't need to know exactly what we're doing, but we can make use of the, of the resources that we have and participate in pitch in. Not in the way of telling people what to do, but rather just showing up and being present and contributing as, as made sense. And I think that would be my circumstance as well. I would also say that um, I'm often not sure what I'm supposed to do, especially in a moment of political uncertainty. Um, and so I think these um, pamphlets grew out of on the one hand, an uncertainty, and on the other, um, a felt need to respond, a felt need to participate, to contribute. Um, and those of you who've taken classes with me know that um, there's often lots of handouts and that they're often handed out flat, but that you then fold them, and so th therefore we get to call them foldies. Um, I had the practice of, in my own, in my classroom, in my teaching practice, before Occupy Times, of always having quite a few handouts of this sort, but they didn't have the fold. The fold came as a consequence of being out in a 
political habitat. Um, and what the fold also offered then was suddenly many dimensions to play with. And it, it opened up the field of possibilities in terms of my own composition. I think your, um, your reference to a kind of collage aesthetic um, in your introduction makes a lot of sense to me. And it wasn't language that I was using. I was thinking more along the lines of, you guys know those, those mobiles by Alexander Calder? So the big complicated mobiles made out of steel with sort of long cantilevered pieces. And that was the kind of logic that, um, for whatever reason, was informing my design choices um, in terms of the placement of images relative to text um, and so on. As for the texts themselves that I was working with, um, Many of them were coming out of poetry that I was either encountering um, out in circumstances like poetry for the people or in my own reading um, and that I was just sort of collecting um, in a kind of haphazard way. And then when I was building these different rules, um, I would just play with different elements until something fit. And because, um, especially at the outset, I was making, I don't know, um, one every couple of days, and I still had to teach and allegedly was writing my dissertation as well. So I was, it wasn't like a full-time thing. Um, it meant there was a kind of um, welcome um, pressure um, but I, there was no expectation that I was going to make one or two or three. Nobody was saying, hey, where's the next rule? Maybe once or twice that happened. But um, the, the, the completely optional character of it, I think, um, was quite stimulating. And then, strangely enough, when I come back into the classroom, I mean, I'm not going out and um, finding myself on the margins of a riot all that often these days. But um, where this form now continues is in the classroom. For whatever reason, more often than not, the handouts I make do incorporate some kind of fold. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what, what else to say about that. Um, and I'm not sure I exactly got to your question, you had the question about representation, which I think I successfully dodged. <laughs> yeah, I would refer to Sor Juana, because um, she's exactly engaging with um, um, the problems that are intrinsic in um, representations that might claim to be authoritative when in fact they might be missing something altogether. It's referring um, to two conceptions of time in, um, um, well, it's basically a philosophical tradition, but on the one hand we have chronos, which is at the root of the word chronometer or chronology. Um, on the other hand, we have kairos, K-A-R-O-S, which is um, what we might describe as the time in which things happen. Chronos is the time in which interest accrues, the time in which uh, semester unfolds, the time in which a jail sentence is spent. That would be chronos, regular time, calendar time, everyday time, the time that grinds us down or makes us money if we're accruing interest or digs us deeper into debt if that's our scenario, chronos. On the other hand is kairos, which is the, the, the time in which things happen, the moment when two unrelated chains of causation intersect and an entirely new possibility um, unfolds as a consequence. And um, this was an informed question, um, and we can maybe go back to see the first rule, um, forgive the speed. Um, at the very bottom, you'll see the word Cairo and kairos. That's kairos written out in Greek letters. I was, um, uh, I think it's safe to say obsessed with the Arab Spring and the way it was unfolding and um, the difficult turns that it was taking. And then I also got very interested in this pun, the relationship between the word Cairo, the name of a place, the capital of Egypt, where um, the most dramatic, uh, at that point, most dramatic unfoldings of the Arab Spring had occurred. Um, and then this concept of kairos, this Greek idea, um, this Greek term of t the kairos is the time in which things happen. And so that was just the kind of resonant pun um, that um, was certainly informing um, this work and, and the way I was engaging with it.
Good question and good reminder about Rasputin. Um, so what happened with Cope? I think he chilled out. <laughs> it wasn't cigarettes, it was, it was um, pipe tobacco. Um, just to clarify that one too. He chilled out, I, maybe he was, he was locked up for a little while and um, he definitely wrote a retraction many years later um, saying, wow, I really went crazy in college or whatever. Um, <laughs> But um, he was not alone. It, sh it, 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 should be, it should be really emphasized that he was one of many who were um, inspired with a kind of enthusiastic political rhetoric um, in, that, in that moment. It should also be said that um, before, the, the, there was a narrow window in which print was not being censored. And it was in that window that authors like Cope like Win Stanley and others were able to um, get their work, um, get their work published and circulated. Um, so um, the the, the I, I forget the exact dates, but the censorship office got closed, um, and they didn't have it um, opened again until um, Cromwell's government sort of got things stabilized. Um, I think the window is probably a year and a half or two years. Um, and strangely enough, one of the people who then worked at the censor's office was none other than John Milton, um, the, the great English poet who's um, writing at, at this time um, as well. Very much inspired by the, same, um, the same, course of, same course of events, as was Thomas Hobbes. Um, Thomas Hobbes, the author of Leviathan, um, great, amazing political theorist, um, also writing at this time, thinking through problems of authority, problems of power. Um, and I should just specify that when I say great, I do not mean that I subscribe to every last thing these individuals said. I just say that as these are some people it's worth knowing about because of the influence they've had. The um, question was about Sor Juana, how I encountered her work and how it informs my practice going forward. Um, in the classroom was where I encountered Sor Juana's work. I was asked by the Evening and Weekend Studies Dean a few years ago if I would be able to teach a class um, that would give students um, a preparation for the MIT and they needed um, coverage in um, multicultural literature, American literature. And so I said, I can teach a class called Literatures of the Americas, would that work? And I was told, yes, that would work. And so as I was putting together my syllabus for that class, I remembered um, studying Sor Juana in graduate school. And um, as I recall for that class session, Alejandro de Acosta came in. Some of you will know Alejandro um, and did a wonderful presentation on this, the, the poem that I concluded with, um, where we read um, Sor Juana's original, and then um, two or three other translations, including an amazing translation by um, Samuel Beckett um, that I recommend to you. Um, so um, as with many projects, um, this um, came out of the classroom and happily also um, in, in includes a conversation um, with a colleague about, about the work and a collaboration insofar as Alejandro was really leading that class. Um, as for next steps, um, she has some really long poems, um, including one called A Dream, El Sueño, um, that I think I might try my hand at this summer. Um, I'm not in any rush, but um, I find engaging with her language um, interesting and um, provocative. And um, there's a great book by um, Octavio Paz called um, Sor Juana or The Traps of Faith, which I think is an interesting um, title as well. He's thinking through her relationship with the church um, that on the one hand gave her um, a space in which to do her work and then on the other also ended up shutting down her work um, once, once it was understood what exactly she was up to. So other question was about punctuation and syntax and um, the like in the Sor Juana translations. Um, my effort is to stay as close to the original as possible. Um, I don't know whether or what the state of the Sor Juana archive is. I'm presuming that most of the texts that we have are, are handwritten transcriptions of transcriptions, so not 
directly from her hand. Um, so there's that to bear in mind. Um, and, but in terms of my own line by line translation, I do my utmost to um, match the English as closely as possible to the Spanish. So this word ostentating that comes up is ostentando in Spanish and it doesn't work in English and I don't care. You can figure it out or I'm guessing that it can get figured out. Um, and that, I started doing that with the Petrarch poems um, because whereas I've, I do have some Spanish, uh, I learned Spanish in high school and, and it, it's um, more readily available than Italian is. Um, with the Petrarch poems, I was actually engaging at, at certain, area, certain times in the drafting process, I would do what's known as homophonic translation, where I would simply try to carry over the sound of the Italian into English even if it didn't make sense. Um, and so that's continued to inflect and inform um, my practice. You tell me, I mean, I'm in total violation of whatever I just claimed. Um, but I, I think that would be an instance of just having fun and seeing like, oh, that actually kind of works and having read it to some friends and they laugh. And who doesn't like a laugh? It's like, oh, the sonnet made them laugh. Cool. I can tweak it a little bit more this way or that way. There's one of the, one of the um, Petrarch sonnets that I translated um, has a famous line. Um, Sir Thomas Wyatt translates the line as, um, how does it go? No me tangere, um, for Caesar's I am, um, wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So it's a line about, you can't touch me because I belong to Caesar. Caesar has set me free. It's the, the idea behind this poem is that it's a deer that um, the poet has, um, has in his sights with like a bow and arrow, he's about to shoot it, and the deer says, no, you can't touch me because I have been selected by Caesar and am one of the king's deers and am therefore untouchable. In that translation, which I was working on in 2002, 2003, during the buildup to um, the um, Bush invasion of Iraq um, after 9-11, I think the line I translated um, something to the effect of, the president has chosen to liberate me as a way of resonating with um, current events there as well. It's a dated joke at this point, but at that moment in terms of what, what the verb to liberate signified, um, especially attached to the, the agent of a presidency uh, or of a president, um, that was part of that resonance. So the, the, the reference is to um, the, the essay that accompanies this Sor Juana um, translation that I concluded with. And um, I didn't talk about this in um, the lecture here, but one of the things I'm engaging with in that essay is um, what I find to be a very useful definition of sabotage. Typically sabotage is imagined as smashing things. That's true, sometimes you need to smash things in order to withdraw um, its ability or, or to, to um, foreclose its ability to do whatever it's doing. But I find much more useful um, the definition that was developed by Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the early 20th century. She was working with the industrial workers of the world, the Wobblies, so-called, and her definition of sabotage is broader. She describes or defines sabotage as um, the conscious withdrawal of the worker's industrial efficiency. That could include smashing stuff, but it could also include what we might call the Bartleby option. I prefer not to. Um, other versions of sabotage along those lines are, you could sometimes call them rule book sabotage. Um, this was engaged in by American Airlines pilots a couple years ago where they were like, you know what guys, we can't take off because we have to check off every single thing in this pre-flight safety manual before we fly the plane. So that would be a form of sabotage in which you follow the book of rules completely. Um, but so to your question about the relationship between um, sabotage with this definition and this larger philosophical idea of um, um, action including embedded within it um, the idea of inaction or of not doing I would refer that to this idea of poetry making nothing happen, sort of the active production of nothing. Um, 
and I know that Agamben has some interesting um, things to say about potential and impotential, impotentialities, et cetera. I find those interesting and provocative um, and um, are related to things that, that I'm, I'm talking about and thinking about, but I haven't read very much of that and haven't engaged with it directly. Got it. Yeah, yeah. The relationship between, yeah, what needs to be the case for things to be otherwise. I'm not sure. Because you said you had resistance to the idea. I've had resistance. That's true. I've, I've wanted things to stay the same. Like, wouldn't it be nice if I could just stay up here and talk for the rest of the day? No, I can't do it because time's up. It's one o'clock. Thanks, guys. Thank you.